He's dying here. Yeah, took me a minute. So. Oh. All right, it's got it on you now, Justin. All right. For some reason, I was clicking around. There you go. You've got to share your screen. Uh, well, I guess I'll go ahead and uh, kick this off. Uh, my name is Brad Gregory. I'm not the guy you see on the screen uh, or the guy that's uh, standing next to the truck in Justin's um, presentation there. Uh, but uh, my name is Brad Gregory. I work with HMB Professional Engineers in Frankfurt. And I'm the moderator for today's uh, session. And uh, you are currently in uh, current drone applications for KYTC. And today's presenter is Justin Wilson. Uh, he's here in District 8. And I will go ahead and shut up and, and uh, not take any more of his time and just turn it over to Justin and let him kick it off. Oh, you're doing awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much. So I just wanted to, we're going to touch bases on some current drone applications that we're doing here in the state of Kentucky for KYTC. Um, so this is our typical, uh, this is our drone setup current. Uh, let's see here. It'll let me, there it goes. So we're going to talk today, we're going to start off with a safety message, um, basically how to get started, uh, who we've helped in the state. Uh, we'll go through some sample data sets and a few tips to be successful. The, big, the most important thing here is um, whenever you go to a job, which we all want to go home at the end of the day, we all have family, friends, um, loved ones. Um, so we always need to, to, to make that happen. We always want to make sure we review the project scope, uh, try to eliminate all hazards first, um, and don't rely on PPE, and uh, make sure you review all the job hazard analysis before you go on to the project. So well, let's get started. So. Um, first thing, before you want to fly a drone, we got to get um, certified, and through that is uh, Federal Aviation Administration's Chapter 14, Part 107 certificate, and that allows you to have a commercial, small, commercial remote, small drone uh, certification. Basically, that certification helps you go through, um, learn about airspace, learn about risk assessment, weather, and all the requirements that go along with the certification. Um, so at the end of the day, when you just need to be able to know where you can fly and where you can fly safely, um, you need to know how to identify um, interferences, um, Wi-Fi saturation if you're downtown, uh, and then magnetic interferences, which with bridges and some tall buildings that we've run across. Um, and then with every drone, you always want to review your user manual, uh, make sure you have maintenance logs and all your emergency procedures, because there could be a time that you do have to ditch the aircraft to uh, make way for a a manned aircraft in emergency situations. Uh, on the right here is an example of a, an airspace aeronautical chart for Lexington. And then just a little brief uh, sample of some drone options. Uh, some recon drones on the left side. Uh, there's the Autel Evo systems, the Altavian, Scadio's new enterprise system. And then there's the multi-purpose DJI drones with the M200, M300. Uh, great recon drones, inspection drones, and then you get into mapping, you have the DJI has their um, Phantom 4 RTK set up. You got the, the vertical takeoff and landing um, wing truss system that can carry a 42 megapixel camera, um, takes off vertical and then flies like an airplane. And then you got the micro drones, you can have the LiDAR version, um, the, the normal photogrammetry setup. Those are all uh, just great options and there's many more out there as well. Um, so for recon, um, so it's a, a good field use drone for just taking um, photographs of job sites, documenting um, conditions, uh, great record keeping, but the size doesn't really matter on those. Actually, sometimes the smaller, the better. Uh, it's easy to pack around, especially one that folds, um, having some good extra memory cards with you, and you just typically need a phone or, or a mini iPad. Great for uh, field technicians. Uh, for bridge inspection, some of the key aspects with a bridge inspection drone um, is having a top-mounted zoom-capable camera, um, having dual controllers. Uh, DJI sells something like the Crystal Sky that's they're real bright. Um, having the streaming capability, uh, Autel has a thing called a live deck that allows you to, it'll capture the video feed 
um, independently from the remote. And then you can take that and stream it, or you can put it onto a video in a, um, like a controlled, um, controlled environment for a uh, command center for uh, reviewing it. So like a subject matter expert would be perfect for that situation. And then having the external lighting to assist in seeing some dark areas. Uh, um, some mapping requirements. Um, if you can have an RTK enabled drone or something with PPK options, having uh, make sure you have the mechanical shutter with 20 megapixels um, would be a minimum, but you also need that sensor size of an inch at least, and then having the mechanical shutter. Having plenty of batteries and size does matter with these drones. The um, I mean, you can get up with the M200, the, the drone size is about two to three feet. Um, it's black, you can see it um, over a mile away. So you can cover a lot more distance with a quadcopter versus like the Phantom 4 RTK here, about a half mile to three quarters of a mile as far as you can see it, depending on what your background is. It, they, it can, uh, with some cloud cover, it gets hard to see. Um, just need, again, you need your mini, uh, need some kind of viewing apparatus, uh, memory cards, Having a laptop will, will set you up for success too, so you can uh, check your data in the field, um, also to, to show that data to other people. Um, having a good survey grade GPS for setting your control points and checkpoints. And then with the Phantom 4 RTK, you have to have the Wi-Fi hotspot um, that, to, to keep, it, keep it working. So who have we helped so far? We, we've been assisting everyone here as we've, built new relationships within our district. More and more people come up with ideas and across the state with the aviation group that Glenn Anderson's built and uh, created. We've um, been helping tons of different people. I mean, we've even, we've helped the Kentucky State Police through incident management, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, environmental, in, in, environmental and Energy Cabinet. We've helped them with thermal imaging, um, the Geotech group, maintenance, traffic operations. We've helped everyone. Um, on the right, here's an example of a zoom capable camera doing a for a, checking some bolts on a bridge. Um, some sample projects that we've done to date, uh, we've with construction, we we do a lot of periodic as built updates. Uh, we design is creating that high resolution current um, image of a or map of an area. Uh, traffic operations, we do some traffic studies, um, create three D models of intersections. Uh, when maintenance, we do some rock slides and landslides. The incident management, we'll go out and test some, uh, document some sites, and if there's crashes, we can check for queue monitoring, different examples. So to, get in, to show some examples of some projects, um, here's a pre-construction project that, or not pre-construction, a construction project that flooded. Um, we came in right after the rainstorm just to, to have that documentation of where the water was. Uh, and it's, it just provides a, just an incredible overview. And I have downgraded the, the image quality just to make it, uh, these files can get massive when you start getting into um, 1080p, 4K, and then this Autel Evo will actually um, video 6K, but not many of our, um, it's not really needed. Uh, it helps with uh, having a zoom, if you have a zoom capable, the 6K will allow you to zoom in to maintain the 1080p. Uh, I mean, again, some overview uh, photographs are just, they're, they're priceless to have that documentation. Um, there's some areas that are just tough to access. You're taking the drone and going in and flying around so you can, um, don't have to physically get out there um, as often to check these locations so you can see how things are progressing, um, especially in the beginning where you're not having to go out and do densities or anything, um, hard number test, you're just wanting to remote inspect it. So with design, so as you're taking, uh, I'll do a lot of manual flights, taking photographs, and then we use um, Pix4D and um, some various softwares, but taking those points and creating, or those photographs and um, creating the point cloud that can actually be used in Open Roads Designer is, uh, is a big step for design. So here's an example of a new construction project, and this shows where I've flown it manually. Um, and then I've got my ground control points set across um, about every seven, 800 feet. And this setup is using the Phantom 4 RTK drone. Um, this is a, about a mile, mile and a half section. Um, 
this is a perfect opportunity to do um, as built checks. So we were asked to do some uh, ORD rock cut bench ch checks, and there was one fill check that we were wanting to do. So, and this is a, a pre recorded video. So the key here to flying manually is there's over 150 foot elevation change in this cut or this uh, fill section and flying manually allows you to try to map, try to stay, uh, maintain the same altitude above or on height above ground. Trying to keep that same GS, the ground sampling distance uh, versus if you did a plane mission and you didn't have the uh, flying by the map of earth capability, you're going to end up if you fly at 150 feet, there are going to be some sections that you're 300 to 350 feet above ground. So your GSD is going to um, double or triple in size. So taking that point cloud, um, we can uh, easily pull in an open rose designer and check some uh, fill slopes. And here's an example of you can see the ground, the ground line by the drone and over the planned. And it's, it's a great, easy check. And it's not um, it, it's very efficient. A great, great tool for um, as-built checks. Right, here's an example of comparing the a one-inch map that we would do for a small project for the um, designers versus a, a two-foot resolution map from the Kentucky State Map Systems. Um, just so much more information you can obtain from the one-inch resolution. But these files do get massive quickly. Now, this is an interesting little project we did. Um, we, we took the drone, um, we were asked to map a little uh, little bridge called Lonesome Bridge in, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And as you can see from Google Earth, you can barely see the bridge even in the fall where there's um, very few leaves on the trees. So then we actually, so we mapped it manual flight under the tree canopy. So between the drone was 10 to 20 feet off the ground the whole time, flying manually, just taking tons and tons of photographs, this little area. And then we could create this map and that's, um, it's uh, corrected for, it's, we have coordinate control. Um, it can be designed with, it, it's absolutely priceless to have that versus the, um, the Google Earth overview image of it. So we can start overlaying our designs onto this map. And just <laughs> when you do something like this, it's definitely key to have two people taking your time flying slowly because um, you're within feet of tree limbs at all times. And it, it is hard to get signal sometimes in these areas as well. Your, your safety nets are a lot more limited. Um, Actually, Ashley, go, go ahead. Just let me interrupt you here. You've got, we've got a question from Ashley Graves that's sort of related to that. She says, how many people do you have in your flight crew? Uh, two. Two, okay. We, we try to always have two. Um, uh, so we have a visual observer at all times. Um, this one's just, it's really important, not as much for like aircraft are, is not going to, we're under the trees so the drone just takes off from us, which it should not happen, but we have that tree canopy to protect us from that, but from uh, other manned aircraft, but just keeping the eyes on the drone to see that you're not going to hit trees are uh, very important. But yeah, that second person's priceless. <laughs> These are these are neat little projects. Uh, so for traffic operations, doing uh, just traffic pattern studies, uh, video basically just videotaping for an extended time, um, the traffic flow. Let's see. It. And then speeding it up a little bit, but they also have drone setups for this for long-term monitoring. You can have uh, tethered systems. We don't possess one, but you can hook it up, and basically you have limited flight. Uh, you have unlimited flight time uh, in those situations and we've done it we've done uh, we create high resolution maps and then we'll also do uh, 3d modeling for traffic operations now here's an example it's it's a little noisy um but we i did i had to turn it i had to turn the map down or the point cloud matches down in order to get the uh, uh, signal heads to show up but from this model we were able to easily go through and um, collect data off the heights of the poles the where the uh, where all of the um, signal heads were, um, and we could do this in a matter of minutes, um, really quickly. It's really easy, um, very efficient. Uh, and some other example. Uh, I'm using the, the zoom capable camera. 
doing uh, some high mass pulls, we can go in and, and uh, read the tops of the, the light fixtures, figuring out serial numbers in order to um, order parts and things like that. It's versus it takes you know, an hour to get that um, ballast down and change everything out and back up, and we can do it in a couple of minutes. Um, some sample um, bridge inspection uh, we've done uh, with maintenance. We've done bridge inspections. Um, assisted with uh, for the assisted the central office bridge group uh, done some roadway inspections um, we've done a lot of rock slides and some landslides as well um, here's an example of uh, some information on the rock slide that we had in uh, Russell Springs but having this uh, high resolution video that we can um, share to the geotech group to any vested parties that that can use it to to start getting information about the rock quality and uh, some potential issues that may affect construction. So then we can we can also uh, map that rock slide. Uh, we went a little overboard with the area, but they were wanting to uh, lay back this rock slope. Uh, rock cut uh, completely, so we got to map the whole the whole setup, and uh, that was a fun little manual project. So this is a th the 3D mesh version, which it's more just for visualization, but we don't use it for um, open roads. And and this is so this is uh, right here's the rock slide. And there's a, a point cloud in, in the background. An example of a, a landslide um, we had uh, down on one of our projects. But we can we can 3D model it with the drone, taking uh, taking photographs, create the 3D model, and we can also make the overview maps, which can be overlaid on the plans. So you know they can show the disturbed limits, the right away lines. Uh, to get that overview picture. And then from the point cloud, we can take the, the data and, and overlay it with a plan and we can see the property line. Can they lay it back more? Um, the ground line will also show the, the head scarp. A lot of information that can be obtained from the, the data in a very efficient, safe manner. With, with incident management, we've done uh, remote inspections, site documenting, traffic queues. Um, live streaming data to, to anyone who needs it, um, command centers, it works perfect. Um, tips, uh, a few tips to be successful, very, very important. Uh, training, training, and more training. Uh, so we always want to set up, when we have a person that comes in with, to do a flights, we want them to basically have a cheaper unit and fly it until they learn the controls. And then we want to get into mission specific training with the actual platform that they'll be using in the field. Um, so like the Phantom 4, as the mission specific platform, we just got to practice, field practice, practice and practice in a safe environment. And then after about four to six hours of where they're comfortable flying it, um, then can go out in the field. And that way they have that confidence that they're going to succeed when they, when they uh, go to the project. Knowing your equipment, knowing the limitations of the drone, um, what it's going to interfere with, um, what can it pick up if you're having to fly low, can it pick up a tree limb, what, what's, um, how long can it fly, uh, how far away can you see it. Um, with the survey equipment, knowing your limitations, your accuracies uh, to, with, that, uh, with that equipment, knowing the software, understand how it works in the background so you know how to perform the, the photogrammetry flight in the field. Uh, how to make that successful, what speed to fly so you're not getting any uh, disturbance on your pixels. It's uh, all that information, knowing everything um, will help in achieving a full um, successful project. So the, the, the most important thing is knowing what uh, your client needs. I, 
I mean, our in-house clients, we want to know what resolution that they're going to want at the end product. Are they wanting one inch, three inch? Uh, three inch covers um, most projects and it doesn't provide a, you don't have a one gigabyte file that way. Um, what kind of accuracy are they wanting a, um, an inch accuracy? Are they wanting a tenth? They're wanting uh, three tenths or just contour um, grade accuracy. Um, how dense does a point cloud need to, to make that digital terrain model for the designer? A lot of important questions to ask um, so you know what, um, how high to fly, because all of those um, are dependent on how high you fly in the field. I mean, if you're flying with the Phantom 4 at 200 feet, you're going to have about a one inch resolution as an end product. So um, if you fly at 400 feet and the client wants one inch, you're, you're not going to achieve it. Uh, so knowing that stuff up front is is very key. Um, I mean, we fly a lot of these projects at 80 feet, 100 feet off the ground. Um, we're getting like a quarter inch resolution, but we don't need to give that to the client. So having that uh, knowledge of what you're doing um, helps. But one of the things that we do it for, um, that we fly low, is it, it doesn't always work out well. And with a lot of practice, you'll see that um, certain equipment doesn't work as well as other equipment and then um, certain surfaces don't um, match stitch together very well in the software so um, here's an example of um, the first two the left and the center one of the same project with two different drones at the same elevation but we have two different um, so the Mavic had a, um, a 20 megapixel image but it didn't have uh, the mechanical shutter and as you can tell it's it's extremely noisy um, they this drone makes a great 2D map, but, um, but it does not make a great 3D point cloud, as you can see. Um, now the Phantom 4 um, will make a good 2D map and will make a good point cloud, but you need to understand that it doesn't work real well on hard surfaces such as asphalt, um, especially at 300 feet in the air. It, 300 feet in the air works perfect on, on dirt um, construction sites, but not on asphalt roadways. But uh, but if you can fly at 80 feet, sub 100 feet to get that resolution down to about a quarter inch, it'll start picking up more of the, the ag aggregate, allowing it to create a nicer, clean mod cleaner model with, with uh, you don't have the noise, as you can see on the right one. And this is a, it's a separate project, but it's done the same way. It's just uh, flown at 80 feet versus uh, 300 feet. But all this is, Practice, um, lots of practice, lots of work with the software, knowing the equipment, um, knowing what, just basically creating yourself, uh, setting yourself up for success. Um, it's, it's key, key to um, having the end result that you can be confident in, that you're, um, that you're not going to get a point 100 feet away that's going to be off. And then going through in the beginning and doing more and more checkpoints uh, so that way you're you build your confidence. It's all about practice, um, it's just a lot of practice and a lot of knowledge and training beforehand so you can have a successful project. Um, actually went through that a little fast, so uh, I have questions, so I'm hoping we'll have a lot of um, a lot of responses that we can go back through here and look at some videos. If you want to, John, if you want to open it up. I'm and, pretty uh, you got the chat window or the... Uh, uh, see, I think I hit, oh, let me see here. Yeah, Brad Eldridge uh, has asked in the chat window, are the details of becoming certified in 14 CFR Part 107, um, what is the basic process? I'm assuming he says, what are the details of becoming certified? Gotcha. So essentially, it's just um, going on the FAA's website and getting the, the manuals, going through reviewing all the documents, uh, and learning how to, the big part of it is learning how to read aeronautical charts. Uh, because you'll have, I mean, there's probably 60 questions on the test and you'll have um, 15 or 20 just of how to read those aeronautical charts. And they'll give plenty of samples. Like I have a job at Frankfurt. Um, what's the tallest object in that, in that region, uh, man-made object in that region. Uh, but you got to go through the website. Um, they have a specific link. Uh, I, I don't know the link off the top of my head, but it's basically you go to it. You'll set up a test site um, just like any other test um, certifications. Um, it's, I haven't tested it and it's been a little over a year. And so the COVID may be different now. So it may be online as at this point, but, um, getting signed up and taking the test is essentially what it is, but then they'll do the background check on you. But that just gets you 
the part 107, in my opinion, it's it's getting you, it's teaching you how to assess risks, how to read the aeronautical charts, how to be successful. But so that's one part of it. But the other key part of it is knowing your drone because the part 107 doesn't teach you anything about your drone. Uh, so it's really a, a dual dual process of um, so like we have an in, internal just going through getting sort of getting basically getting certified on a platform in addition to the part 107 to, to be successful. So is that an internal certification that you got? You guys so we have? don't have a, an actual certification, but it's an internal program. Or whatever. Like, yeah. like Glenn, Glenn Anderson's working on developing that internally, but our goal is to have so many X hours on a basic airframe and then X hours on a mission specific setup. So going how to do a certain project. That's kind of what they're going towards um, in in the state for the state. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, making sure everybody knows if you if you have any questions, make sure you present those or you can type those in on the uh, <clears throat> the chat feature or the Q and A Q and A section. Either one, we'll monitor that and we'll be here for for a little bit more. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess one question I have, Justin, is is what about ground control points? Um, you know, what's a typical density or how much? What level of effort are you going to to set ground control to, to rectify this back to i got you so the minimum is three so on a minimum i'll do is five which is three ground control points and two checkpoints and that's as i built um as i built confidence in the equipment uh, with the phantom 4 rtk or something with a ppk enabled drone having one um, i've i like to have one like this project um was about every 700 feet and what I did was I'd go back through and I would stop the project, pull one of the, I'd go in the middle, pull one out. So I'd have 1,500 feet between ground control points and leave that as a checkpoint and see how it affected my accuracy. And I, I figured I found 700 feet was kind of my uh, sweet spot of, of not having my basically I had diminishing returns after about 700 feet or anything denser than 700 feet. It was diminishing returns on on level of. Um, density of my ground control points. Um, but that's with the RTK and PPK enabled drones. The older models where it's just GPS drones, I mean, it was nothing, I'd need about 200, 250 feet every, um, every, every, I would need a point about every 250 feet with a standard drone, uh, meaning like the older Phantom 4 Pros, uh, which is what we uh, started with three or four years ago. Uh, what I try to do is I always try to hit key points, low points, high points along this center line. Um, some of the things I look for, uh, it, it's just so that way I'm kind of sandwiched in the middle on my, uh, I know like the top of my hill and the bottom of my hill are tied in. But with that Phantom 4 RTK, because it, it has the base station that's given the correct, the second corrections. And then, ha or having the PPK naval drone that can connect to a base station, so it's always making corrections for where that drone is when it takes a picture. That's the key to taking it to where it's not. The, it reduces the effort of having to put ground control points every 200 feet, but about 750 feet is the typical uh, spacing, kind of, and then a little bit upper. And I try to stay between 500 and 750 feet, and then I'll put checkpoints along the way to, um, to, give, to build my confidence in the in the equipment. And the are checkpoints you, also give you a uh, backup if you need to use those as your ground control points. Are you typically using uh, RTK, GPS, or? or, or yeah. Um, yeah, the R10, um, R8, R10 um, Trimble setup for our GPS systems. So, I mean, we're typically I mean, uh, using those. I mean, we're getting shots. Uh, like this, this little particular project took us about 30 minutes to fly, uh, what you see here. And uh, about 30 minutes to set up those uh, ground control points, uh, which it was just more aggravating to drive from spot to spot because it's extremely rough. Uh, so it, it's very efficient. Um, we're not having to go rock, run around all these benches getting shots. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get, uh, it's just, there's a lot of data you can capture quickly uh, and safely. Gotcha. Uh, we had one other question. It looks like Ashley Graves may have answered it for you, but it was uh, from Tim Shore and it said, once certified, do you need to be recertified within a certain time frame? And she had yeah. every two years. Yeah, every two years. And the research only, uh, I believe it's 40 questions. It's a little easier. Um, I've had to do the research once, and I'll have to do the research again, research again um, next spring. Uh, but it is definitely a little easier. Uh, not necessarily easier on 
it's just less questions. Gotcha. Yeah, you have to do it about every two years. Ashley has got another question. It says, have you tried the linear flight uh, adjustable height option in the DJI, DJI RTK? I have, uh, I've been messing with it, but I have not um, got it to do it successfully yet. I'm trying to import the, it calls a digital surface model into the, the drone setup on the Phantom 4. And I, I have not personally been successful with it yet, but I'm looking forward to the opportunity to not have to fly um, manually. I want to be able to fly automatically. The one issue with some of these projects like this one, you could fly it manually the first time. And then now I've got my digital surface model and then I'd be able to, to uh, fly it automatically after that map of earth. But where they, they cut it, it is no longer, you can't use an older um, surface model from any um, like state plane or state LIDAR setups. Uh, so I'm not sure how, so you still have to do one manual flight at least on this, in my opinion. Uh, gotcha. so it, it's, I, I, I want to get there. I, I don't like, it, it, it's fun flying manually and doing it, um, but it's, I'd rather be consistent and I don't have as a, uh, much concern of having holes in the data. Sure. We had one other uh, question that came in on the Q and A and it's from Thomas Hines. And he said, bridge light inspections, uh, bridge lighting inspections and flying drones at night. Um, mm -hmm. So sure. um, actually just before, I, I don't I don't have it right now, but before I came to S, or KYTC, I worked with SME and I had the, um, the night waiver it's about a two to three month process and it's gotten a lot quicker than it used to be. Um, we just got the night waiver and I did thermal imaging for a, um, it was a radio tower for, um, and they were trying to do, an, uh, we were trying to do a uh, inspection on the grout inside. They grouted these steel uh, columns, hollow steel columns, solid, but it was a night, night um, flight. And it is, you need three minimum four ideally ideal, you have to have your your radios. You have to have all your training on um, night night awareness because um, there is the sickness you can get from looking at the light, the bright lights. Uh, we had you have the three mile um, three nautical mile strobe light on the drone. Um, we put extra flashlights on the drone for helping the to get the visual image, and then we maintain the spotlight on the drone because you're supposed to um, uh, light up the area around it. Uh, we also do, before we ever fly, we do a kind of a sketch out of what's all around your area um, before you fly, create a little map because you have to know where all the hazards are, um, especially if you're not able to fully light up the whole area um, with some kind of um, external lighting. There's a lot, you have to have um, ditch zones. So you have to literally have lit areas that you know that are safe to try to quickly land or actually let the emergency um, shut off the drone to get it down quickly for a, a helicopter coming in the area um, or if the drone goes, um, loses signal. It's There's so many more levels of um, safety that you have to do, but it is doable. And once you get that, the waiver, it's good as long as you're in, it's usually good as long as you're in class G airspace. Um, uh, you're, it, it's, it's a lot, um, once you get it, once you go through the process, you know your your protocol, your routine. It's it's not difficult, um, but it, it is a lot more cumbersome than just flying it in the daylight. Gotcha. Um, well, well, we'll stick around here for just a couple of more minutes uh, for a question. I guess one that I thought of that you touched on there a second ago was thermal imaging uh, mm -hmm. and some sort of a thermal you know uh, sensor payload. Um, is that something that the cabinet has any kind of use for? I know it seems like that's becoming. Yeah in the uh yeah. yeah eec has the the xt2 um xt2 is a is a thermal imaging camera by dgi um it's on the m m200 series drone a uh, very very handy drone um i mean we used it to find i found voids in uh, steel columns uh, and the voids in the grout within the steel columns I, they were using it for eec was using it to locate um, and map out the extents of uh, abandoned um, mines um, basically the surface was on fire and they were mapping it out with the drone because you can actually um, 2d map with it as well that that camera pix 4d will will create a 2d map of all your thermal images um, it's, I mean it's great for uh, 
looking for uh, delaminations and stuff like that in bridge decks with the right situations and temperatures and um, that kind of it's a lot of background on that but there's a lot of capabilities uh, from that instance a lot of in with environmental looking for bats and stuff like that there's um, great opportunities i've done handheld versions of thermal imaging for bat studies it's um, but i bet it'd be amazing with a drone getting up on their level uh, there's a lot of uses for thermal imaging very very uh, very handy good deal uh, well, Justin, we don't have any other questions coming in. Um, you know, I guess we can stick around on here and you can stick around if you want, or, um, yeah. you know, yep. it, it's totally up to you. I'll stick around yep. if everybody pops up, but yes. that, I appreciate everybody attending. I certainly appreciate you, Justin, and uh, the great presentation. Uh, as you'll notice in the chat, there was a reference to your PDH tracking sheet. You can find that on the main page uh, for the Brella. Uh, platform and then basically keep track of your PDHs the same way you always have uh, sort of an honor system. So um, outside of that, I'm just going to mute my mic, uh, Justin, and I'll probably hang out here for a minute. You're welcome to uh, keep your camera going and your mic going or, or whatever, or we can or you can jump out. It's, it's, it's totally you. Do you want to open it up so anyone can speak, or how do you? How would you like to do that? Uh, well. If John is able to do that, we can do it. I'll have to look and see if I can do it. Because um, I can go in more detail if, if people have questions about specific um, point clouds or slides. Uh, I tell you what, I am going to enable all attendee mics. I don't think that unmutes everybody. Well, I still I to do that, but it's not letting me do it. So. I'm going through right now, guys, and manually just turning everybody's mics to where if they want to turn them on, they should be able to. Looks like Scott Sherman's got his hand up. <laughs> Scott, if you want to try to um, unmute your mic and ask a question. This is the I'm trying to get the pause. I can blame it. <laughs> Here's an example of the uh, a manual flight project that we did with the uh, rock slope. Um, it's uh, it's cumbersome. I don't know if it would ever be. It, I mean, it's feasible to do with the flying it by a map of Earth with a digital surface model already integrated into the drone. But we flew, you usually fly these kind of in an S pattern, um, but you're flying nadir on the roadway surface, and then you just kind of step over towards the ditch and then kind of want to tilt your drone up, your camera up about 45 degrees and then work your way up to within your, your vertical on the rock face or your nadir to the rock face. And then as you go up, then you want to S back over and then get nadir on the top of the uh, slope. Hey, John, I just got a text from somebody that said that they didn't see where there was an option for them to unmute their own mic. Okay, uh, just a second. Let me get Jennifer over here. I see a spot where I can block their mic, but I don't see anything about where somebody... I think my, my interface looks different than everybody else's because I'm part of the presenter. Justin, on that one where you did the manual flight, do you have to, each one of those exposures, do you have to manually fire that or is it doing it based on some sort of a, like a distance offset? Yes, yes I'm manually firing every single one of those. And so it'd be it, easy it, to get a gap in there then? Uh, it is, but you try to prevent, you put some uh, redundancies in there to not to not have those by like flying, like right here, I have two flights side by side, just to double check on the, on the bottom of it. Uh, but what you do is you watch the screen go across and you want at least six pictures, six pictures of an object. So yep. as you start and I always want to start to the outside of where your area of interest is. And then as you walk, walk across, you try to maintain the same speed and you're taking pictures and you're watching that that um, camera is flashing as you cross an image 
and I try to get at least six. Um, and I and technically you could get four, and then when you do your overlap, you'll get the the remaining. But I try to always get the um, sufficient overlap in one direction, and then come back and get it again. It's uh yeah definitely clicking about every about every second to get the photographs as needed, and trying to fly slowly so that way it takes the picture, resets um, is is definitely a, a trick. The um, Pix4D has a free flight mission. And then you can actually set up, it flies off a of GPS to where it knows when the drones move so many feet forward, it's going to take a picture. So like every 20 or 50 feet, um, except the problem is Phantom 4 doesn't, this Phantom 4 RTK does not work with Pix4D. <laughs> and it's frustrating. They don't want to, um, their flight software does not want to work together because um, they have their own little setup and they don't let third party um, apps onto it, but that's ideal. Yes, you just fly, and then every time the drone moves forward, it automatically takes a picture. It's ideal, but it's gotcha. John, so you to figure out how to unmute somebody. Uh, Justin, this is Bob Yeager from District Six. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Bob. Okay, I I, I figured out some way to get my turn my mic on. I don't I don't really know how. Um, but uh, if if another district was interested in doing this. Can you give us an approximate price of what it would cost for like a startup kit? I mean, I saw you had a you had a trailer and you had a lot of stuff. I'm sure that's not yeah. what to start with. Oh no, for mapping standpoints, this setup is what Glenn Anderson with Aviation got us, and it's roughly on uh, the ballpark of eight to ten thousand. Um, John, did you look at those prices recently? I, I believe it's that eight to ten thousand range for that mapping setup, and that's not including which. Most districts have their own GPS system, the surveying crew. That is correct. The like the RTK setup that you're using right now, the Phantom Four right there is it comes in right under eighty five hundred dollars. Uh, last time we purchased one. Does that use the? Uh, does it have its own base station like you see there on a tripod, or are you able to use your own base? Yes, we never been. I haven't been able to figure out how to uh, use your own base with this setup. It's some of the DGI is a lot like Apple. They with the updates and everything, what their restrictions. So, um, yeah, they, you have to have that base station as of right now. I, uh, I have, so I got another question from Brad Eldridge. It says, looking at flying a potential rails to trails project with heavy tree canopy and power lines. Any things to consider to receive good coverage? may have missed some general details for something like this. Uh, tree canopies try to wait, you know, wait till your trees, your leaves are down. Uh, power lines, you fly, fly high enough over them. Uh, I mean, I, I've flown on some, some high KV lines and actually with the Phantom 4 Pro and not had any interference to flow down between them. I've done a natural gas line before in Georgia and a lot of times those, uh, the gas line was, adjacent to or underneath the uh, high voltage um, strong I call them strongman poles I mean never had any issue with a drone but uh, and I, I flew that one manually but to get the tree canopy we've done I did a um, I had to map a slow moving landslide so the trees weren't gone and I had to do it over a period of time about once a once every two weeks and in order to get the ground to show up is we flew about a hundred, about 25 feet above the tree canopy manually. And you had to make sure you auto focused every time on, well not auto focused, manually focused on the ground before you took the picture. And it would help pull the ground out of it. Cause if you fly too high, you're going to get too much of your image is going to resolve on your um, tree line, the tops of trees and not the ground. Uh, so, Flying low, hopefully it's not a huge area. Um, if it's a linear project, it's not too bad, but manually mapping a, you know, 100 acres is, it'd be tough at that low altitude. Uh, flying linearly for miles isn't isn't that hard. Just uh, tedious. Gotcha. I'm not sure if that answers it. Uh, um, Scott Sherman, you had your hand up a few minutes ago. You should have the ability to unmute your mic if you want to, uh, ask a question to uh, to Justin uh, yourself. We've got about, um, Brad Eldridge said, thank you, Justin. 
Um, we've got about 16 minutes left until two o'clock, which is when it shows. I believe that it shuts us off. Um, mm -hmm. I would say we probably won't want to go all the way up to um, to the two o'clock time because I think that's when the next session starts. So we'll probably end just a couple of minutes early uh, to give people a chance to get to the next one. Yes. <laughs> Walk across your desk to get to the next one. But um, mm -hmm. any other questions, folks, feel free to uh, speak up. Uh, so we do a lot of the landslides. Um, we do, I fly almost all of those manually. A lot of times there's down trees. We, um, I did a lot of work in the past with North Carolina's Department of Transportation and, and we did some uh, landslide studies. And, and uh, before we, before we started, um, we had to have a, we weren't licensed to survey in North Carolina. So we had to sell about that portion of it and they wanted to fly. And we tried to talk to them about the advantages and disadvantages of flying manually versus um, automatically and automatically you would fly typically just um, in tiers. So it's all flat hundred feet above ground where you take off and then you draw another box and come up 200 feet and do it that way. And you have to be really careful of drawing your boundary too large and they lost the drone by, by not doing it correctly. It's um, very, uh, so final manually, you can get up close and personal with it. Um, you can find a lot more detail, especially if you're, you want to video it um, just for the reconnaissance, look at your head scarps. Um, and we flew one in Eastern Kentucky. You, just, you can get between trees that way. Uh, there's, um, for a reconnaissance standpoint, not mapping, they have like the Scotio drone set up. They have a um, some older, they have an older version and they're coming out with the enterprise version, but they, they'll do, basically you fly straight and it'll automatically, if it, finds a, if it comes to a tree, it'll find the way around that tree to keep flying straight. Um, and it's a smaller platform and it, I think it's in the ballpark of $600 range for the, the older model. And that there's there's several situations, several different drones out there to do different tasks, specialty drones. Um, that drone was designed to chase people on bicycles through woods. Um, <laughs> And it, it, but it also becomes a really handy tool for someone who's trying to walk around a landslide or try to get up close to the landslide without physically having to uh, walk up on the head scarp. What about battery life? That's one thing I don't think that you okay. touch. Sorry, uh, this Phantom 4, um, about 30 minutes, 20, the design's about 30 minutes, 25 minutes trying to leave. You want to leave 20% battery on the, on the drone, but 15 is pretty much, the, I would, wouldn't go less than 15 because you can set the adjustments in there, but 20% 20, 20 batteries, what you want to leave it with. But So you get about 25 minutes and I can comfortably um, go down and back in both directions and cover a whole mile total in, a, in one 25 minute flight on a linear project. And that's with a rotor copter? Yeah, that's this one in the picture here, the Phantom 4 RTK quadcopter. The, um, the Autel Evo, theirs will go up to about 40, 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes total flight. Um, the Phantom, uh, the M, the larger, let's see here. Some of the larger drones will go. Fixed wings, probably, fixed wings probably more geared toward doing the linear. Yes, yeah. I mean, I have some, I've done some uh, documenting utilities for, um, for a utility section. They'll go through, so those will be with some larger areas off the right away um, having that when they go out and mark all the utilities doing your flight documenting the the uh, the flight and all the painted markings it, it's that's priceless to have that where you can come back to and it's all um, you have an, you have a geo corrected you have an XY for all the way along that line and um, we've also done utility lines I'm uh, sorry uh, electric poles I'm flying the electric pole so you can check where their guide wires were placed on their easement. It's a uh, very, very, uh, there's, there's tons and tons of op op opportunities out there to use these drones. But the one here in the middle, the DJI, I call it the multi-purpose drone. It's the M210 and you can put a top mounted camera and two on the bottom. But um, with just one camera, that one was rated for I believe about 38 to 40 minutes. But that larger platform, it's probably four times bigger than the DJI Phantom 4 RTK on the right here. And you can see this drone for a mile to mile and a half in one direction and, and physically see it 
no problem. Uh, so you can now cover, if you're mapping with it, which this is not a real good setup for mapping, but um, you can cover three miles in one in one flight. And so a lot of these linear projects, when I was flying manually, I'll fly up the right ditch on the right side of the road and then come back across the road perpendicular and come back on the left side. Uh, they're uh, pretty easy. You can fly, fly about 150 feet um, to keep that GSD down. You'll you'll cover a lot of a lot of ground. I, I flew uh, just doing two D mapping. We flew uh, natural gas line 150 miles of natural gas line. All they wanted to document was uh, vegetation, and we'd fly 30 35 miles a day. But we a lot of it would be um, we could just chase it with a side by side. In the you're in rural areas, and we had a pilot and we had a driver, and we could stay about a thousand feet behind it and just sit there and just take pictures. And that way we could do about six mile chunks at a time with it. There's there's plenty of opportunities and different different setups, but they're they're definitely the flight times are getting up there. Um, these micro drones, I think they're in the ballpark of 50, 55 minutes. And as you get up in the aircraft, I mean you can get to an hour, an hour and a half, no problem with those those setups. I mean, you're covering four to five hundred acres with the, the aircrafts. Are you uh, are you also uh, <clears throat> are you carrying a lot of times generators or some way to charge your batteries while you're there? Yeah. So uh, so you're able to charge one while you're flying one. Yeah, so the battery will last about you know about 20, 25 minutes, and then by the time you you'll charge it in about an hour and fifteen minutes. So you want you definitely need about a minimum of three batteries, ideally to have five to seven, um, depending on how larger projects you do. But when I did that long distance flight. Uh, we had to do, uh, I had to have at least seven before I could keep going and never have to have a, never have to take a break and wait on a battery to charge. But three is ideal. Um, we'll cover 90% of your projects. Uh, if you had five would be perfect, but we, we had this set up now. Um, and Luke here had put it together for us um, before I came and he, he's got, we got solar panels so um, we can keep charging. And now we have uh, natural gas generators on it as well. But, uh, as soon as we get to work, we we can turn turn the, um, the the inverter on for the solar and start going and uh, keep charging con continuously. Um, not necessary, but definitely very ideal, um, especially if it's cold uh, or hot. Uh, and we don't have air conditioning, but when it's cold, it's really nice. <laughs> I'm not the best for you guys. I get a couple times I give you just an air conditioner on there. It's pretty easy to add. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we bought a little heater for it. Um, it's uh, really nice to get out of the cold. John, uh, John, you know, John Seth has given a, a good a good shout out to you guys and said uh, that a district, our District 8 crew has done an excellent job on helping grow our UAS program and finding new ways to apply drone use. Uh, thank you to Justin. Uh, Wood Turner and Tamara Wilson for helping these guys with anything they may need. So yeah, you guys really seem like you're pushing the boundaries and the envelope uh, for the technology there. So pretty impressive. Yeah, we love it. It's uh, it's fun doing the data processing, seeing the end results, seeing all the way through. It's it's fun. Um, we get out on all the district, see all the all these new locations. It's a great opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, looks like we've got about seven minutes till two o'clock. Um, you know, I, uh, I guess we can, we can, like I said, stick around or, or you're welcome to sign out or, or do whatever. Uh, just remind everybody that um, you've got your PDH form is on the uh, main page. And um, you know, appreciate you coming. Appreciate you being here, Justin. And uh, we look forward to the uh, future UAS and drone, drone application. Yeah. Sounds, sounds good. But one day we do uh, we fly from the office and fly anywhere. <laughs> Long ways away, but <laughs> just take off from here and go do anything. It'll be just like the uh, the Amazon delivery stuff that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah. The uh, be funny like in snow and ice ice duties chase the chase the uh, the past the vehicles the salt trucks. So it may have one mounted on all the salt trucks and it just deploys from a salt truck. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of getting kind of far out there. Uh, yeah. I got a question from Randy Crawford about where do you find the survey, and I'm assuming that means the uh, uh, the, the evaluation survey for this session. 
I, the one I was in yesterday, it should be emailed to you or um, somehow appear on the, the application. Yeah. Here closed yeah, out. John, yeah, John said it closed out. Yeah, 155. Yeah. Well, it's uh, giving me a beeping warning saying the uh, webinar will end in four minutes and 50 seconds. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump out because I've got to go jump into the next one and uh, get ready to moderate it. So anyway, I appreciate it, Justin. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. Right. Uh, thanks, John. All right, bye.